We all have our favorite albums, the ones we know and love and will continuously listen to for the rest of our lives. But then there are also those iconic albums in many genres that sold millions of copies, everyone loved, everyone knew of, and now we're probably pretty ashamed to admit they were part of our culture because they were awful. And this is why we should be regretting the past. It feels like every few months a BuzzFeed or clickbait post is shared with the title Worst Albums of the 90s, or 10 of the Worst Modern Bands Ever. But what made them so famous? How did they get so successful? Well, as Occam's Razor proved how the simplest answer with the fewest assumptions is most likely accurate, it leads to believe that the better the album sales, the bigger the name. While some bands stand the test of time and continue for years after one strong selling album, there are clearly others that died out an embarrassing death and are only years later called out for how ridiculous the world of pop culture is for thinking it was a big deal, and how much regret many of us have for having bought into what Carson Daly showed us what's popular on TRL. So in my new series, Regretting the Past, I intend to look back at some of the biggest names and best selling albums in the rock genre that definitely should not have got the attention they received. And sweet mercy are there a lot of examples. But in my mind, I can't think of a better name to start with than Limp Bizkit. Between 2000 and 2001, it feels like the only quote rock band that was ever acknowledged on MTV was Limp Bizkit. They had a gimmick, a look, and a huge following. However, that seemed to all fade into oblivion after other bands would emerge and Limp Bizkit would dissolve. Years later, it feels like Limp Bizkit are one-third of the Triforce of Suckage from 2000 that also includes Creed and Nickelback. But after charting a massive amount of success and airplay from the album's significant other, the band announced the title to their third studio album, Chocolate Starfish and the Hot Dog Flavored Water. Everyone thought he was joking about the title when Fred Durst announced it. But he was telling the truth. In fact, Fred Durst even refers to himself as a chocolate starfish. Of all the things to refer to yourself as, you choose an anus analogy. Classic. What causes my mind to implode is that this album by Limp Bizkit not only went multi-platinum, but it sold over 1 million copies in its first week. It is the fastest selling rock album of all time. That is insane! That means there were lines of red hat wearing baggy jean posers lined up all around a Best Buy like it was Black Friday. Or Limp Tuesday. So not only has Limp Bizkit made a fortune from the late 90s and early 2000s, but an album titled named Chocolate Starfish and the Hot Dog Flavored Water made millions of dollars. Really think about that, people. Currently, the album is selling for $3.48 on eBay. I'm slightly shocked it's selling for that much, but then again, if people are willing to buy 80,000 copies of the new Nickelback album its first week without even listening, then this shouldn't be surprising. So to prove my point at why a chocolate starfish and a hot dog flavored water may not be the bright light that many people want to remember and it's something we should regret, I am going to do what probably no one has done in over 10 years. I am going to sit here willingly and listen from beginning to end this entire album, track by track, of Limp Bizkit. Limp Bizkit! <laughs> <laughs> what an idiot! <laughs> what are you doing? Actually, no, I keep that fact. I can hear what you're doing. What, dude, are you gonna keep like rolling, 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 rolling? Limp Bizkit! <laughs> Just a basic robotic intro, nothing special. Let's move on with the rest of the music. Whatever you want to call it. Oh my gosh, I'm in my late 20s and I'm spending my free time listening to Limp Biscuit. I feel like if my father found out, he would be so ashamed of me right now. Wow, so much for being lyrically creative and trying to push your writing. Why do that when we can just use the F-bomb to explain every aspect, emotion, and object you can? Later in the song, they make tribute to Nine Inch Nails closer. Wow, they couldn't even stretch out enough original writing without ripping off a good song. It's interesting because I feel like this is an original beat and the guitar work is strong. The riffs are deep and crisp. 
it feels like the song has a good pace, but hearing Fred Durst whine the F word dozens of times just to hear him proclaim Kiss My Starfish makes it so I can actually feel brain cells standing still. I guess it's an opening song that describes their attitude well enough, though. I mean, they're not denying what made them famous on MTV and how they acted and pretended to be angry. The song definitely captures that feeling, but there's no appeal to ever listen to this again. Ever. I mean, none. Hopefully there's some more content in this album that actually pulls me in and gives me something for replay value. This has to be the first time I've heard this song in over a decade. I do remember hearing it a lot on FM, but why? Because the album was selling well? At least this song has a little more variety in lyric writing. It's not a lot, but it's more than repeating the same expletive. Again, the guitar riffs are great and there's a strong beat. I feel like this is a pattern for a lot of Limp Bizkit's music. If it wasn't layered behind an extremely whiny and monotone vocal pattern, it might have some promise and substance. In my generation, it actually dips down in tempo and you can hear a great bass line that preaches into some of the band members showing off their individual skills but it's all flushed down the drain when somehow tied back to people complaining about no one caring about their generation. What is the point? This isn't anti-authority or fighting the system, it's just vague complaining. You don't care about me. That has been done a thousand times and screamed at parents by teenagers a million times more. I have a feeling there's a pattern going here. How 90% of this album is just going to be whining about not being treated like a king. Oh my gosh, I'm right. It's like listening to an album of a bunch of toddlers complaining about not getting their way at daycare. Like they don't get their favorite toy or the little kid's picking on another little kid. I feel like this is where everything starts to flatline. It's apparent there is a format to the song style in this album, and now the songs are all starting to sound extremely similar. You could easily replace verses from one song and another, and it would not make much difference. I mentioned the flatline part because now the music is starting to lose its edge as well. It doesn't have much variety anymore, and it feels like everything is just mashing together. I'm not sure if it's intentional or not, but this song is bland. Milk and toast with vanilla wafers for dessert bland. When this album came out in 2000, I think it was just because it was supported so strongly on MTV that no one could escape it. It's what all the 13 and 14 year olds craved and they wanted to represent rock in that way. This was the new thing, this was the anti-authority. But where's the appeal? It's not anti-authority, it's not fighting anything, it's just complaining. What is so great? My generation was tolerable? What's the stand behind? Why did this sell so well? My Way was on radio play for a while, several months after the album's release. I don't remember people singing or even referencing to it though, but apparently I have blocked out part of this time period because My Way apparently did the best of any single from this album. It was even on the Billboard Top 100. I can tell there is effort put into these songs, and it's clear everything is mixed well and all the instruments sound great. The bass, the rhythm, it's all there. My Way actually feels like a song that if you heard on the radio without seeing the name Limp Bizkit, you wouldn't instantly switch to another station. That being said, it's time we look at the most well-known song from this album, and also the most mocked and probably the most laughed at song by Limp Bizkit ever. This song was everywhere. MTV, VH1, sporting events, commercials, even The Undertaker came out to it as entrance music on Monday Night Raw for a bit. It was inescapable. For radio, this was supposedly the perfect rap-rock hybrid that in reality was more poppy than bubble rap. It's a shame that this song is laughed at now because if you strip out the vocals then you can hear just how good this beat is and how amazing the guitar is. The music involved here is excellent, but it's ruined by some of the worst lyrics and cheesy lines possible. It begs for a better vocalist. 
Can you imagine how good this beat and music would be if someone like Zack De La Racha was laying something down on the music? Something meaningful and well thought? Rhymes, you better get some better beats and uh, get some better rhymes. Oh. Really? Get some better rhymes? Let's let's just look at some of the lyrics of this song roll in itself, you know? Let's see what the rhymes are like here. Shut the fuck up and back the fuck up while we this track up. How is that rap? That's not even rhyming, it's just repeating the same word. That doesn't count. Oh my gosh, how much more of this do I have? Six tracks? I'm not even halfway! Uh, you okay, dude? No, I, I don't know where he is. Just, just look for the bandana and listen for the screaming. Just keep going. Come and get some. Oh no, which way to go? And I'ma keep my pants sagging, keep a skateboard, a straight cam for the tag. And I'ma keep my pants sagging, keep a skateboard, a straight cam for the tag. Great bass line. There is a fluid melody and rhythm here that could have something special if it didn't have the lyrics of a man child complaining about how he's still gonna be a man child. Oh my gosh, it doesn't stop. It doesn't. It just keeps going. It's all starting to blend in together. Just nothing but whining and complaining. I swear, it's getting to the point now where all I hear is this. I'm just going to start breezing through the rest of these because I'm going to lose my sanity if I spend too much time on them. It has to be said again that Wes Borland is an amazing guitarist. Possibly one of the best of that era of the early 2000s. He made that guitar riff with the Mission Impossible theme iconic. I know the song first came for the soundtrack and not for chocolate, hot dog, starfish, whatever you want to call it. But let's be honest, this is the strongest song on the album. This is the one that you can actually get behind, and you can actually feel good while listening to. In fact, if you had a gun to my head and said I had to listen to one Limp Bizkit song for over and over again for an hour, this one would be it, and I'd probably be okay with it. Wow! This is actually sounding good. The drums and bass line and that rhythm are great. This is something that would actually get me excited to listen to an album. Oh my gosh, he ruined it. All that buildup was completely canceled out. It's amazing Fred Durst has that ability. It's like he's some kind of talent nullifier. He kills the mood worse than an embarrassing dad joke in front of your friends. No. It's another slow build one with a good rhythm. It's gonna be ruined again, isn't it? ISN'T IT?! You keep your distance, I can't deny you. Hey! He's not screaming or whining. <laughs> it's actually like he's trying to sing a bit. It actually isn't bad! We had to listen through 50 minutes of nonsense, but... This isn't bad at all! It actually resembles something you'd want to get behind! Some talent! Effort! All the way through! It has an atmosphere! Wes Bortley can play the guitar and just strum along like it's liquid smooth! I feel I think I found something that doesn't make me embarrassed to listen to it with the name Limp associated! I have hope now! I know it's possible for them to construct something! What's next? I have hope! What's gonna be the next song? Alright then. It's the rap version of Roland. 
And I admit the lyrics are much better here, but he also had the help of three other musicians in DMX, Method Man, and Red Man. So, eight people made this song at least. Or at least Limp Bizkit in those three. My head hurts. Now you may have noticed that I skipped a few tracks, like the insanely long outro or Get Your Groove On featuring Exhibit. You're not exactly missing anything, so you're welcome. And you're also welcome for not making anyone else listen to this from beginning to end. I can't believe this was so successful. Is this the worst thing ever? Absolutely not. But that's what's infuriating! There's actual potential here from some of these musicians, but it's all cancelled out by a man-child from Florida! Why was this so successful? Because MTV wouldn't stop playing them? Because Ben Stiller was in the Roland music video? Because they were in Mission Impossible 2 for that soundtrack? Because Carson Daly loved them? It doesn't make sense! I could go on and on about how many musicians back in the early 2000s suffered while bands like this made it to the top and made millions of dollars, but at the same time, we all are in the same boat. I think just about everyone regrets that Limp Bizkit existed. Sometimes it's good to remember the past. Sometimes we need to regret it also. Chocolate starfish and the hot dog flavored water is not even worth remembering though. It's just a stain on the underwear of life as good old JR put it. And I for one hope to never hear this again because it's just gonna make me more upset about so many good musicians being wasted behind the whiniest crybaby I have ever heard. I know there are a lot of people out there that are still Limp Bizkit fans and are still supporters of them even in 2015, and that's fine. If you enjoy what they do, like them, support them. But I can't stand them, and I know I'm not the only one. And I also know that chocolate starfish and the hot dog flavored water is something we should regret, especially as it being one of the fastest selling albums of all time.